Where'd John go? Is he hiding? Who am I getting my signal from? There you are. Okay, and you're giving me the thumbs up, and I'm giving you the thumbs up. Are we rolling? Speed? Okay, let's do this thing. Wait. How do I do it? I do that, and then I do that. I want to start my timer over again. Okay, and then I hit that. Okay, I have a speech prepared. In 1983, a musician skilled in the fine arts of guitar playing, studio engineering, and in television soundtracks struck out into the vast and largely unexplored explored, excuse me, frontier of game audio. His vision was to create the Beatles of game music, and he would later be joined by Dave Govett, Kevin Phelan, and Joe McDermott to create Team Fat. This team would shake the world with music and sound that would push the boundaries of technology and creativity. But this musician had no idea how far his influence would reach. What began as groundbreaking soundtracks for projects such as Seventh Guest and Wing Commander would soon reveal a personality that no one had seen before, and the likes of which no one has ever seen since. With cleverly disguised bravado and suits made by the great Nudie Cohn came heart, humor, and soul. He is a true pioneer a magic maker, a Willy Wonka of our industry, a great friend, and the recipient of this year's Lifetime Achievement Award. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in honoring George, 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 George Singer, the guy from Austin, Texas, who they call the Fat Man, the Fat Man, the Fat Man, the Fat Man. Now I'm the Fat Man. George, the Fat Man Singer. I have arrived. I am home. Uh, there's a sage in San Diego named Thich Nhat Han who suggests that practice. He suggests taking two steps, saying, I have arrived. Take two more steps, say, I am home. And while that's sinking in, I'm going to give you something that is going to use, that you will be able to use to make your business successful no matter what that business is. Using the two parts of this time-honored system, you will be able to make things great for yourself, your customer, your end user, and you will maximize profitability. <laughs> and in case you haven't guessed yet, for the next seven minutes, I'm going to be pretending to give a TED Talk. <laughs> now, actually, before I go into that mode, it's near the end of the day, you're beat. Uh, this might run three or four minutes over. So would you rather that I run three or four minutes over, or would you rather that I talk real fast? Is, is, is running a little bit over cool? Yeah. Running over? over? Talk real fast? Both. Oh, both. I'll do both. <laughs> uh, and, and, and who here is in game audio? OK, good. Uh, who's more of a business person? No, a couple, OK. Uh, more artistic, uh, OK. Good, good, good. Who's looking for work? OK. Who's, who's like working and got as, enough business all that they need? Oh, wow, OK. That's, that's good. All right, and I'm glad to see a, a mix. Um, let's get this out of the way. Our business is, thank God, becoming aggress aggressively inclusive. Uh, so please do not hesitate to picture yourselves as part of this world I'm going to show you. And your daughters and your grandfather and your exchange students and all shapes and abilities and genders and languages. Now, as we step into this short pretend TED Talk section, I want you to be mentally applying all of this to your life, your music, your product. Welcome to Product Strategy. I use the elevator pitch and the fourfold path. Product strategy is fun and simple when you know how to do it the fat man way. First, the elevator pitch to get the race car of your product onto the track of your market. You need to know, and this is serious, your product name and category, 
your target customer, what that customer needs, why your product fills that need, who the competition is, and why your product is better than that competition. And you'd be surprised at how many people don't know all those things, or they think it kind of vaguely, and, and they haven't communicated it to the rest of the team. But you need to know them, and you need to be consistent with them, and here's how you do it. The miraculous elevator pitch. Now, remember Mad Libs? Just fill in the blank for a country singer who needs to look important. A nudie suit is a custom stage outfit that is covered in embroidery and rhinestones. Unlike Shepler's off-the-rack suits, a nudie suit makes it clear that you've got the same great tailor as everybody who played on the Grand Ole Opry stage for 30 years of wonderful country music. Or for a parent who needs a great day with the kids, Disneyland is a Short vacation option, oh, oh, TED Talk hands, that everyone knows about. Unlike Six Flags or a national park, your kids know and love all the characters and the songs. So we call this an elevator pitch. It's a short thing and your whole team can memorize it quickly and consistently. Why? It keeps you mentally consistent in your business vision from your first napkin sketch to your mighty IPO. Engineers, composers, producers, who's ever making the thing you sell, everybody needs to be on the same page as the other so that the right thing gets made. Your marketing efforts will be aimed at getting the benefits your product provides to the right people. You'll be giving them what they need. Create the right demos. Go to the right conferences. And everybody can get on the same page fast because it's short. And if you change your mind about something, which you will, you just look at the elevator pitch, change a couple of words, disseminate it to everybody, they rememorize it, it's easy. Details can follow in time. Now, how do you fine tune this? Bring on the fourfold path. That's pretty easy. You don't want to solve a minor problem that no one has. You don't want to invent a better buggy whip, right? You might want to invent a better record player. That would be hip. OK, an extendable brand. Certain brands work for lots of things. In case you change your mind about what you're doing, if your path changes a little bit, as the fat man, I can use that name to cover an ad agency, uh, production, the sound effects, think tank conferences, all kinds of things. So I also started songsforgames.com, which I found doesn't even work if somebody like doesn't like games or doesn't like sound, my uh, songs. Uh, and you want to find the strategy that sticks your customer to you. For instance, Splash Data is my password tracking software. Uh, OnSong is my chord chart software. Nuendo is my DAW. I have so much invested in those, I don't want to change. You know what I mean. Now, think about the power of the elevator pitch and the fourfold path combined. The two processes inform each other. I see some people are taking notes. This is good. And they build into a very powerful business force, right? Right. Right, right. So now you have the power to do the mystical incantation of these two things. The elevator pitch and the fourfold path can get you what you want. You have to walk out of this talk now satisfied. Satan is appeased. So if you'll allow me, I'd like to finish out the rest of this talk on another topic. And with one final TED Talk mannerism, I pause and I walk to one side. <laughs> In every TED Talk, there comes a moment when the speaker pauses and walks to one side and maybe changes, changes their tone a little bit, tells a story that's maybe a little personal, maybe a little embarrassing. I take off my glasses, then I can't read my notes. <laughs> if you took notes, good. I use product strategy to keep myself on track nearly every day, and it will help you. But some people, maybe especially you artists, Maybe with me on this. Business strategy 
it can't be the whole picture. You're probably looking at this and going, wait a minute, how does it, wait, huh? And I agree. I wear cowboy clothes, all right? I'm the guy, I put out a coloring book of me and my team uh, driving hot rods and wrangling snakes. Everything needs to be applied with balance and perspective. And for me, historically, given the choice between doing something smart and doing something beautiful, I have kind of a problem. I choose to allow all my experiences to be joyous and loving. Let me show you what I mean by presenting just the tip of the iceberg of a life that has been always delightful and has never really made much sense, probably just like yours. And if you like what you see, you know, think about how you're going to give your keynote talk when it's your turn. <clears throat> Here we go. Buckle up. I used to dress like Abraham Lincoln. I don't, <laughs> I don't know why. In nursery school, and there's at the uh, senior prom. I found the tux in a paper bag in the band room, so I wore it. And that is this whole talk in a nutshell, really. I grew up in Coronado, California. My parents were doctors. Sister Wendy moved to Texas because of the Army. She eventually became a colonel. She had a huge command. Brother Rick won the World Science Fair in high school. I think you can guess which one he is. Then he was a ranger, saving lives in the High Sierras. Dave has seven Grammys as drummer for Sleep at the Wheel now. We should not have gotten a dog that big, but we did. And then we got another dog that size to keep it company, and that's how I was raised. Now, have mercy on me. This was my high school band director from middle school through high school, Robert G. Demon, the leader of the great surf band, the Astronauts, from Boulder, Colorado, which is not a surf city. He dressed Western and sharp, and he drove a Corvette with a souped-up engine. He taught us about showmanship and professionalism with pithy sayings we called demonisms, notably, flute players and trumpet players are the best kissers. That, that comes in important later. In seventh grade, I hung out in his office with the cool 12th graders, cracking jokes I did not understand. And he taught us the guitar secrets of surf music on the actual astronauts' guitars. So it was me and that bass and that guy, and I didn't stand a chance. Bob was in the movies and the TV shows that had go-go dancers in short skirts and boots. And speaking of flute players, little side quest for romance. This is Cindy, AKA Red. Bob the astronaut had cast her in a skit as Little Bop Riding Hood in go-go boots and a miniskirt and a little basket. Her entrance music was like, one day Little Bop Riding Hood. How could I not fall in love, right? <laughs> so around then, my mom circled an ad in the newspaper, singer guitar player wanted for the First Baptist Church of Coronado, five bucks a week. So I grabbed that gig, and I wore this white suit like a dope. Cindy sat in the front row, and she was pretty sure that I would get fired for singing all the wrong songs, like Sounds of Silence, because that's what the cool kids at Hebrew camp sang. But I found out later, it is not Baptist. Bless her heart, Cindy's mom sometimes asked me over after church for grilled cheese and soup. And Cindy and I, I confess, <laughs> a little bit embarrassing, we made out on the band bus. Uh, she was a freshman by then, I was a senior, and one of our parents took this picture that night. Do we look a little bit like we've been up to something? <laughs> but she was dating my brother, as you can see by how close she's sitting to him. And she was dating my other brother a little bit, too, so I had to play it cool. <laughs> it was different times, right? <laughs> it's hard to be cool in that white suit. And then there were the bands. Inspired, of course, by the astronauts and the Beatles, I had bands in high school, in college, and just after college. Et cetera, rock revival band, the one in high school. Hot music from the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And I was always designing t-shirts and logos and painting drum heads. The bands were always the center of my circle of friends. My brother Dave was in all of them. And, and yes, in that top picture, he is standing up. He grew a little bit, though, after that. Nice neckerchief. There's Cindy in the hat, one of our 
very few gigs, et cetera. Now there's the college band, Mantis. Out of dedication to this band, consider, consider this path split that I took here. I changed my major from physics and engineering to music. Smart idea? Yes? No? No? Yes? No? Yes. Nice vest, though. But at least I never wore uh, gold lame. Oops! <laughs> <laughs> and, and I do have platform shoes on that are like this high. I nearly broke my ankle. Coming out of college, the Flakes played sold out Fridays and Saturdays at Doug Weston's famous Troubadour Club during the LA early 80s. Thank you for the laugh. New wave scene. And you can still get a ticket, actually. You might be late for the show, but 50 bucks and you're in. Seven bucks more, you can wear a Flakes button. Show that you're a real fan. Of course, sooner or later, let's call it 1981, all bands break up and I should, I should step to the side again and get sad and change my tone because it felt hard. You know, because I didn't know what to do if I wasn't in a band with my brother. And I had nothing to fall back on except a music degree <coughs> and, and a little bit of a USC film school, actually. So I tried a lot of things that didn't really pay. I had a little mobile studio called Real Cheap or Real Mobile, depending on the customer. And I, I tried to sell a book of drawings of puns about sheep. So like there's a, a doghouse with a sheep in it and then a frowning sheep, and it's like Shea Pup or Sheep Pout. And <laughs> so thank goodness I had a van so I could still get gigs like helping friends move their stuff. <laughs> Which came in handy in this next side quest, recording. I learned to work in a 24-track recording studio. I married my first wife, Linda, a mechanical engineer, and we used to jam at the studio with my boss, Ben Webster, shown here, and his fiance. And we found out that jamming without goals is great medicine for when the band breaks up. So remember that, it might come in handy. Van is a futurist. You can't read the fine print down in the about the author. It says he's a futurist. Uh, this was his PCM 1600, the only privately owned digital two track in Los Angeles. It could actually record digitally in what was later to be called CD quality, but people didn't know what CDs were yet. So <clears throat> often it would record without clicks and pops, and only Van and Sony Corporation had that capability at the time. So putting these four units into huge anvil cases and hauling them in my van to the recording mastering facilities in LA while they carved the wax, I got to help people make the digital masters for a lot of the first ever digital compact discs, which we often had to explain to people. And then I'd set the levels, I'd push two buttons, and I racked up some big resume jewelry like this. Peter Gabriel, he bought the sandwiches one time, so I kept the tinfoil off my sandwich. That's it, right there. And in exchange, I gave him my lunchbox, which also had Maurice on the other side. There were three different ones. I got in trouble for swapping the left and white channels of Elton John's Too Low for Zero on the CD version. So this is big time, right? Now this here, this is the second ever article in Mix Magazine about computer tools for the musician. And yes, the author, Roy Brown, is code for me writing about myself. Still pretty, pretty directionless. I launched ventures from Van's studio, including Conbrio Productions, because through my synth mentor, Brian Horner, second from the left, we had access to something very exotic, a Conbrio digital synthesizer, which looks like a coffin at a Christmas party. Together with Adam Holzman, Brian and I created what was meant to be the world's first sound effects CD. And our client was Adam's dad, Jack Holzman, who did the sound effects records that all of us film students use. Do you remember these? And who was the founder of Electra Records. I think at the time he was the president of Warner Corporation. He, he discovered the doors, this guy and the product fizzled anyway, and that just goes to show you something. Maybe that's one of the lessons I didn't learn. Maybe <laughs> don't jump to conclusions. Adam went on to become Miles Davis's band leader, so, you know, that's cool. Also, I wrote a, an article for Millimeter Magazine about how sound could actually be helpful in movies. No, it's true, it can. And I interviewed Basil Polidorus 
and I got the connection to Bruce Botnick, the Doors producer through the Holzmans, and Alan Howarth, who lived next door to the Flakes, where we rehearsed, and who sometimes asked us to turn it down so he and John Carpenter could compose the Halloween soundtracks. He also did special sound effects for all the Star Trek, the first like six Star Trek movies, and Raiders of the Lost Ark, and my favorite, Buckaroo Banzai. So quite the sound designer, that guy, next door to us. OK, games, at last. It, it, the games had been a big escape for me in college, and I loved them. So by offering to work for free, I landed a gig with my brother Rick's ex-college roommate, Dave Warhol. The platform was in television. The scope of the project was one 10-second tune. My tools for that gig were guitar, four-track recorder, and manuscript paper, and eraser. I used a lot of eraser. Would I be going too far to call this a triple A game? <laughs> the Intellivision lawyers realized later that I should be paid, so I billed them. And Intellivision went out of business shortly thereafter. This was 1983. <laughs> Almost 10 seconds. If that's a surf version coming up. Cool. <laughs> that's the only one of my tunes I've got to play for you guys. Uh, I got another gig working for Paul Edelstein, a relative of an old friend of mine. And the music actually changed as the game tension changed, and that was pretty radical. My tools were pencil, paper, and the Atari music composer cartridge. Waiting for the next game to need music, Paul taught me to program in fourth an offbeat language created to control telescopes. It was even offbeat then, OK? And I programmed a very crude modular synth to run on the Atari 800. And meanwhile, Brother Rick, oddly enough, I remember he's the, he won the World Science Fair, and he's a ranger in the High Sierras. OK, then he was actually a cook at the South Pole, and he had a Timex Sinclair computer with him. And of all things, he was learning to program in fourth, which led, oddly enough, to a couple of great years. SideQuest, interface design and graphics software. Game gigs dried up for everybody in 1983 and 84. However, Brother Rick was the programmer on ValPaint, the first color paint program for a personal PC, which was all programmed for the Epson QX10 computer in fourth. And Rick thought that I should design the interface because I said, hey, let's use a mouse and menus instead of what he had, which is like control function five shift up arrow equals dither mode engage. So that made me the genius of the family. <laughs> I know. Rick's boss, Bill Volk, liked me because I had a cool radio control car and I brought it to the interview. And that's all there was to the interview. Okay? But, but this, is, this guy's legit, you know? Because he, he was proud of discovering me. And he's also, he says, I'm proud of two things. I discovered you and I discovered the Miller brothers. I'm like, what do you mean? He says, he, he plucked these guys from obscurity so that they could produce their first game, the manhole, so that they could go on later to produce the mega hit, Mist. So me and those guys. And he also hired Dave Warhol, my, the brother's roommate guy. And the vibe at Rising Star in 1983 was not unlike working for Magic Leap 30 years later. Here I am predicting that computers will be important to art. Every bit of it is set up in what we call a stabilized architecture. Valdox version 2 is a new kind of personal tool for the information age. It combines 11 separate functions, word processing, a spreadsheet, graphics, mail, even a color painting system. The artists I've talked to think that this is going to revolutionize the world of art. So you're in a good department. <laughs> it's, it's going to be, the revolution is here. Wow. The revolution is here. Sometimes you know that you're the hit of the trade show, and it should happen to everybody at least once. Here's Rick these days. A couple years ago, we got ValPaint running again. And note that the icon for Path Recorder is my old four-track reel-to-reel machine. So I'm a digital artist as well, aren't I? Now, after Rising Star, I was inspired by the book Texas by James Michener. Linda and I didn't want to raise kids in LA. This book made it seem like you could become a part of Texas history by moving there and declaring yourself a colonel or something. So in 1986, we up and moved to Texas. It's a famous, impulsive move that people have done throughout history. Once there, 
a little more famine between feasts. So I sold t-shirts for a while. Uh, I wrote some articles for the music papers, tried to get some work in the recording studios, thinking the big names on my LA resume would land me the cigar chomping gigs and tell people they'll never work in this town again, and I'd be the fat man of Austin. And I'm like raging like that to my brother, and Dave said, he says, uh, uh, fat man, huh? So I became, that's how I became the fat man. Was it smart? Is it a great move? Good branding? You tell me. It just happened. And then MIDI became accessible to PC users. Thank you, God. So I started doing custom backing tracks for songwriters and vocal teachers who needed instrumental tracks and things like that, you know, karaoke things. And I got an MT32 because it could do multiple voices. And nobody had thought of it as a sound card uh, for, for PCs or anything. And my music store guy, Dave Roach, wisely got me into Mark of the Unicorn Performer. Not digital performer, MIDI-only performer. Great program. My pitch to customers was custom music for $29.95 a song. And when I get too busy, I would raise my prices, you see, which I think fits the rules of product strategy, but I don't remember because that was a long time ago that we talked about that. Uh, one of the best songwriters I met in Austin during that time was Joe McDermott. We produced a children's music together of his songs, and it was musically beautiful. NES and Game Boy hit. And Dave Warhol, the Intellivision Brothers roommate, now rising star guy, he calls me again, and it had been about six years I was up to like $59.95 a song. So he hired me for a bunch of tunes for Game Boy and NES and PC. And you can see his credits on Wikipedia. At the top there, there's Thin Ice, the first tune. And then we parted ways for a while. Du -du 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 -du. And then around 1990, he hired me for Dick Tracy and then Swords and Serpents and then Total Recall and pretty much all the games after that. And these are just the ones on Wikipedia. There's a lot more. And I wrote... In MIDI for the MT32, he had created software tools to do the tones and make it work on the platform, so it was pretty easy for me. I had some inkling that he was doing something really difficult behind the curtain, but I really didn't know what it was. So I'm sitting here feeling great about myself and I'm not worrying about what other people are doing, right? But I got busy. I'm going, here's my chance to get the band back together again. So I hired Joe from the children's music record, and two other guys who'd sought me out for various reasons. Dave Govett, and if you know him, you would understand this. <laughs> he had called me like out of the blue, heard that I was writing some game music, and, and, he, and he wanted to come over and see my gear. And then Kevin Phelan had read some of my writings, and he wanted a philosophical mentor. And Kevin brought Teresa Avalon, who was just learning marketing and Linda on bookkeeping and administration, and there's Team Fat. So Dave Warhol kept sending us work, and he sent others to us, and we got to where we were pretty much dominating the American PC game music market, I think. It seemed that way to me, and when I went to my first computer game developer conference, I wore cowboy clothes for some reason. <laughs> Astronauts, maybe Texas history, maybe it's the Abraham Lincoln syndrome. Uh, but anyway, I was pretty much the only audio person at the GDC, CGDC. And somebody there pointed out, everybody needs sound for their project. You're the only one doing it. Whether they know it or not, you're going to do business with all these people. So I was pretty popular at that party. I was solving a common major problem in a growing market. Not intentionally, but it happened. And I feel it's important to point out that for one brief shining moment, I got to feel rare and valuable and wanted. And I wish that on all of you. It felt really good, even if it was an illusion. Uh, <laughs> because it's, it's harder these days. And I'm not sure that if I had had internet like, informing me that there were a lot of people who could do what I could do, I'm not sure I would have had the heart to proceed uh, without that little boost. I don't know. Maybe I would have. But that's how I see it. Because it was a time of modems and message machines and uh, mail and magazines, and people making games needed sound. I could do it, and they did not know how to find somebody else who could do it. So network meant something very different, and it meant something very valuable in a different way than it does today. 
Also, there was no world market, and there was certainly no community of game audio in the United States. Until I started phoning around to find out who played musical instruments and getting jams together like this one. Now, you don't even want to know who these guys are. You know, don't ask me who these guys are. You don't want to know. Okay, there's Michael Land from Lucas. Okay, Michael Land from Lucas Arts and Al Lowe who, on sax who created Leisure Suit Larry, Jim Donofrio, Dave Havaloso who was running sound at Sega, Neil Grandstaff who was doing that at Sierra, Dave Albert, Don Griffin, one of the few independents on trumpet. That was a good jam. That was actually the Intermedia Conference in 1993, and as far as I know, that was the first public game musicians jam as this 16-year-old t-shirt will testify. Now, for a while, at least in my head, the game audio community was pretty much, it was our sporadic jam sessions, rogue jam sessions. Some people knew more about the awesomeness of audio that was going on in Europe, Japan, but I did not, so I had this sort of permission to think of myself as awesome, as I said, which doesn't mean I wasn't awesome, and it doesn't mean that I was. Add the fact that I was using an MT32, which was suddenly an exotic sound card. It all led to things like Wing Commander and Loom and Seventh Guest, where I became fast friends and a great, a great admirer of Graham Devine, the co-producer of Seventh Guest. And I have to brag, I beat him at pole position. I, he programmed pole position when he was like 14, right? <laughs> Seventh guest, first general MIDI game. I used general MIDI out of lazy cleverness, clever laziness. I didn't want to program, I didn't want to redo my MIDI files for all seven possible sound cards. But there was only one general MIDI sound card when I wrote the Seventh Guest, so, so it really didn't sound good when the other GM sound cards came out. So I felt badly that people were hearing crummy sound on Seventh Guest, so what do you do? You dress up Kevin in a lab coat and start Fat Labs, which is sort of a general MIDI certification service. It got to where you couldn't sell a chip to a Taiwanese sound card manufacturer unless it had the fat seal on it. So I had this like billion dollar industry by the, I had a grip on them. I never, <laughs> I never did squeeze, I never, I never really got it to turn into money. Uh, but it seemed the right thing to do so that General Mitty would sound good and people could hear the seventh guest. And it got me in with the hardware software guys and I ended up helping start some of the organizations around that, which were needed because Nothing made your computer crash faster and harder than a sound card in those days. I don't know if you remember that. Yes, he's feeling the pain. <laughs> the joke about the Interactive Audio Special Interest Group, or IA SIG, was that it stood for, I actually started it, George. <laughs> so it's a very proper trade organization with like bylaws and stuff, and because of that, I had a little trouble behaving myself. And in addition to that, all these engineers were saying, George, what's the future of sound cards? And I'm like, I wanted to tell them, right? But I didn't know. And I'm like, well, let me introduce you to my smart friend who knows. And my smart friend didn't know either. It was too hard. So Teresa and I thought, well, if it's too hard for one person, let's, let's, do this, let's come up with this crazy idea, Project Barbecue. We got Linda on board. We would get 50 people from these rival sound card companies together on a ranch in Texas and we get them drinking, you know, laughing whiskey out their noses and smoking cigars and jamming, and we would solve all these problems, and it would be the most loving and joyous thing ever in business. And I'll be dogged. It actually happened, and it's in its, that was 1996, it's in its 23rd year. Just, they just had that last month. Here's Van, my futurist studio mentor. He's back and he's awesome facilitating a barbecue work group, and significantly David Roach, my music store guy, had accomplished some significant projects in the intervening time, and he was very well connected in that industry. And he led the top secret group, the Screaming Monkeys, to fix a lot of those compatibility issues that we talked about, and eventually create the high definition audio standard, which was the path to the fact 
that your audio doesn't crash your computer as much. So pretty good. And they say that that could, well, you know, the three holes on your PC, there are also three holes on your Mac for a while there. How could the PC and the Mac have the same hardware? Well, only secret meetings. And much of the good stuff in game audio has had its roots at barbecue, including one working group under Van, which was inspired by Tommy Tallarico's barbecue presentation and led to the Game Audio Network Guild. Yes, those are the guns that Tommy wore when Gang was proposed. Uh, and Gang actually gave me that Lifetime Achievement Award at the beginning, so maybe I should be a little embarrassed about that connection. I'll stand up in my embarrassed spot. We also started Project Horseshoe for solving game design's toughest problems. And that just had a really good 13th session last week. Publicity. I sent out the first demo tape ever for game audio, I, I think, which included this fast food box. There were also fishing lures and worms and bugs and stuff in there. And that was designed by the great poster and album cover artist, Bill Narum, who also designed the nudie suits for ZZ Top. We had the way too cool Frank Kozik design the fat seal. Joe drew the coloring book, and we sent out press releases. And since game audio was novel, think about that, there were a lot of articles about us, which I don't think ever got us a single job. And I tried to get the Texas governor's office to make me an honorary colonel. But they, <laughs> but they respectfully declined, but they tried to steer me on to saner things. Dana Hanna brought me in to score sounds for the robot dog Ibo, and later for the prototype experiences on the Kinect, which was top secret and called Project Natal. Treehouse side quest. What was the name of that cartoon show? Code name, kids something, code name? What's it? Kids, kids Next Door? Yes, it was like that. Team Fat. They were my absolute best friends. We lived like the monkeys. Monkeys? You know who the monkeys are. Okay, you got to look it up. Or like the Beatles in, that, uh, in Help, where they go in four separate doors and they're in the clubhouse inside. It was like that. Here's my, my second studio, our second studio, Abbey Trails. It was described as a treehouse, and mom and dad ain't coming home anytime soon. There are some of the articles about us. People Magazine in the red frame and the black frames along the top are some of my brother's Grammy nominations. Uh, we had four little studios and one huge recording room, and a couple of us actually lived there. Kevin built a little thing, a little frame out of two by fours, and then we draped a shower curtain over it, and we ran a garden hose to that. And then it, it used to be a dark room, so inside we, we ran a, another hose from the hot water up through the air vents, and so we had hot and cold water, and we took our showers there. Yes, the greatest team in game audio showered under a garden hose, which was very interesting. Thank you. Because <laughs> the people, at, that's the sound that would come from over the little fence where the Jiffy Lube was. And, uh, Booger the ferret lived in a non-working microwave, which was connected <laughs> by tubes to a cage behind there. Brother Dave recorded some great musicians at that facility. Uh, you know, we're world-class pickers, and uh, a lot of them actually reported later that they no longer believed in the recording studio that looks like the cover of Mix magazine, you know, that, that thing, the clean. They said, you know, I think I want to have a studio like Abbey Trails where miracles of music can and do happen. So that was a great place. Now, Bill Botorf, this guy here, you can see him twice in that picture, he worked for Autodesk in Austin, and he outfitted all the companies with their graphics software. Well, he liked Abbey Trails so much, he had the guy who does LiDAR scans of the Sears Tower do a point cloud of Abbey Trails. He's missing ceiling tiles and all. So, I don't know, someday I can do a visual tour. I love that place, and I love Team Fat. We used to crash conferences with our band equipment and play surf instrumentals dressed as cowboys. <laughs> we had a... We had a great time. It probably cost us work because it looks like we only do country western music. <laughs> uh, 
that's us. It's, it's an easy song once you get the blah, 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 blah down. I volunteered to put a pit band together for the first Dice Awards. And yes, those are the LucasArts Stooges, Clint Bajakian, Michael Land, Peter McConnell. And my brother was playing drums. He took the picture. I tried to pick up some business in 2000 by doing a Willy Wonka promotion at GDC. If you got the golden ticket, you could come and stay with me and tour Abbey Trails, and we would write you a free tune. The winners paid their own airfare, and we covered the rest. We took them horseback riding and shopping for cowboy hats at Shepler's. I made some good friends, including Brian Robbins and the Enigma, whom on the right, <laughs> whom I hired to be my Oompa Loompa. And he started coming to our jam sessions for a while, but he only really liked the minor and diminished chords, so he quit coming. Brian still hosts the website IHateTheFatMan.com. This is because I had said, he had said to me, everybody likes you, fat man. And I said, you know, if everybody likes you, you're not really big time, are you? So he's IHateTheFatMan.com, and now I'm big time. So I was just looking through the photo gallery that's on IHateTheFatMan.com, and there's some pretty dope pictures. That it's a real jam when the guests start to pick up the trumpet. No painted drum head. Jay Schaefer smoking one down. They stayed in tents in our backyard. Uh, the Museum of Famous Laundry. Enigma gave me that accordion, which does sound as bad as it looks. Uh, Circus-themed side story, OK? Little circus stuff. This antique circus poster, World's Most Entertaining Fat Man, obtained by David Allen, the supplier of antiques for TGI Fridays. Now, he had me pose for a picture for a cowboy-themed decor thing, but they changed their minds about it. But we thought, so we thought that the picture like, never made it out there. But he said, maybe it's in like a couple of, a couple of stores in Slavic countries somewhere. So of course, I'm bragging about that, not knowing whether it's true or not. Years later, Gene Rosenberg, who has saved the sound of many a game and company and who jammed in this room many times, he was working in Poland and having a bad game audio day. You all know those. His included snowstorms and hunger and the whole bit. But the day was saved when he saw my picture in the TGI Fridays in Warsaw. There it is in the corner, lower right. You see that little blurb there? Zoom in, zoom in. There we are. So I'm actually world famous in one booth in one restaurant. <laughs> I only worked on one car, and I was the only person who ever worked on it, this 58 Rolls Royce Silver Cloud. And I enjoyed playing it being a limo driver. Once, on the way from the wedding to the honeymoon, we start talking about the enigma. It comes up that there's a show, and this couple says, let's go. So on their way to the honeymoon, we stop off to say hi to my buddy, which leads to this entirely unwholesome picture. <laughs> and I don't really know how to rationalize that. Maybe it's some kind of moat that keeps people from stealing my customers. By the time the Wired magazine compared me to P.T. Barnum, it started to sink in that the publicity thing might actually be working against me. And there we end the circus-themed side quest. In fact, Things had changed radically. I was no longer the audio guy, the only audio guy at GDC. There were now thousands. And there was not thousands of time as much work. Can I get an amen? <laughs> and one of the saddest things that I ever experienced was when we had to end the business relationship between Team Fat. We called it uh, promoting them to family. So that was hard. Uh, but the pendulum does swing, and let's try to remember that. In 2000, a very weird, smart, longtime friend of mine, the creator of Furcadia, invited me to do audio as he designed Meltdown, Dr. Cat. Now, Meltdown was one of the most significant slot machines ever for multimedia games, now called Every. It broke open Indian territory to slots, uh, and it set all kinds of records even after that for earnings. Variants of the game are still being played today, which is weird. And best of all, the signature Meltdown sound is recognized as a big part of its popularity and money-making power. You've heard that in the casinos, right? He does me. Here we are in Las Vegas with the great slot machine producer, Benny Sum. You can guess which one's Dr. Cat. I was that company's audio guy for 15 years from their strip mall 
office to their billion dollar sale. And we did all kinds of firsts, right? We I got tangled up in designing the hardware, took it from boops and beeps to orchestra, you know, the whole bit, just like in games. And the people there were great. The company was always threatening to hire an in-house team, regardless of how cheap or good I was. They were like, weren't looking at that. They were looking at, we want in-house. And so for most of 15 years, it was like Princess Bride, sleep well, Wesley. We'll most likely kill you in the morning. I wrote a book during that time. People still seem to love it, I guess. It's used in game audio classes in China. Can anyone ascertain? We'll find out when Gene Rosenberg goes to China. Uh, you can get it on Amazon for like five bucks or 300 if you want to spend that much because sometimes because it's out of print. So someone goes, oh, it's rare. I'll sell it. Uh, you can get it on Kindle too. That's cheaper. So this famous Rolls-Royce mechanic comes to Austin. He's doing a seminar. Good bad goes up on the lift. The mechanic says, give up. She's headed downhill and accelerating. I say, but I've got my whole lifetime to work on it. He says, I don't think they make lifetimes that long. So I get all sad. So I showed him. I rebuilt the transmission, which he said I couldn't do. I rebuilt the brakes. I kept her running for years, got up to 100 miles an hour. This is documented on YouTube, but I'm digressing. I was pretty sad when he said that, and Bill Botorf was also at the seminar. He had Rolls Royce too. And he heard the conversation, and to cheer me up, he invited me to his next meeting. He was creating a video game archive at the University of Texas with Richard Garriott, AKA Lord British, famous for Wing Commander and the Ultimate Games, and Warren Spector, famous for Deus Ex, and both of these guys I knew and had worked with, and I became a co-founder, and now I have my own little museum, which lives in the same building in which James Michener wrote the book Texas. And all my junk is in there, including my first guitar strings and the little newspaper article that my mom circled to get work at the First Baptist Church. Uh, notice here in this picture the grease stains where I worked on Good Bad. That is not in the archive, unfortunately. Job bins, that's the stuff, the blue things on their way to the archive. Uh, I learned about that at the t-shirt company. Each of those bins has about five jobs in it, and it is full of ADAT tapes and cassettes and discs of all kinds and paperwork and VHS and God knows what. And the archive was so weird that my archivist spoke at the archivist's convention about how weird my archive was. And, and the Library of Congress got in on it, too. And they, they did an article about it, too. At the opening celebration of the archive at Lord British's Lakeside Castle, I was in charge of entertainment. So I suggested, of course, a game that I designed called Tezuzizo, where you basically the rules are everybody gets a bottle of ouzo, a taser, and a fez that says, I'm playing on it. And the rules write themselves, see? <laughs> good physics makes a good game. And I also suggested good physics. I also suggested segue jousting. Now, we toned it down a bit, but that's essentially what we ended up doing. And also, I'm thinking, of course, here's a gig for my nerd band, the captains of the chess team. So yeah, a gig opportunity. Here's me and Lord British playing a replica of the first video game ever. And this replica was hand soldered by its creator, Ralph Baer, who Bill put me in contact with, and he and I became friends. I spent a weekend at his place back east inventing stuff with the man who invented the singing greeting card, the game Simon, different Simon, and actually the very concept of video games. And video games, what he said was, it was a faucet on the wall that you could turn and money poured out of it. And so his bosses, a Motorola, let him do pretty much whatever he wanted at that company. Something to aspire to, right? And he was proud of his whistling, and he was developing pretty good chops on harmonica, and a little known fact that he would want you to know. He always had Mozart-like melodies going on in his head. And he'd want you to know that he never learned a damn thing except by making mistakes. By then, I had started a webcast for hackers and makers called Fat Man and Circuit Girl with Jerry Ellsworth, who dropped out of high school but lectures at Stanford, who reverse engineered a Commodore 64 into a joystick form factor, and who created the Cast AR augmented reality system. And I met Jonathan Colton, a huge influence on my songwriting. He wrote Still Alive for Portal, 
uh, and Code Monkey, which if you don't know that song, you should listen, and, and Chiron Beta 5, and, and uh, just great stuff. I made a very wacky and functional guitar for him called the Monkey Pony. It has a mic built in with vocal harmonizing built in, and the harder you push down against the strap button, the more the vocal harmonizing kicks in. And then he wanted pads on it so that he could play drums from, you know, from MIDI. So that was his thing. So we go from this kind of high, we got to do another sad thing. One day, alas, the song, the, the slot machine company calls me up and they said, we're making good on our promise, we're hiring all in-house. They made me an offer to come in-house, but I couldn't do it. And I decided to move back in with my parents in Coronado, move out of Texas. They were ready to have somebody staying with them. And besides, I'd met up again with Cindy at a class reunion where et cetera had been asked to play. That's a little miracle right there. And I asked Cindy if I could sit next to her. And she said, if you promise, you will never leave. So I did. It was time. So 40 years after making out on the band bus, Cindy and I got married. We wore kilts. And she carried her little basket from when she was little Bop Riding Hood. We now play together in the band in that same Baptist church. And her mom still attends, and I still get occasional sandwiches from her. No $5 a week, though. Now, back in Coronado, Dad and I took a couple of hours on Tuesdays to make stuff in his workshop. Brother Dave says, oh, great, just what we need, one more thing George is really good at. Which brings up an interesting data point because I had a pretty good resume and contacts and I was good at a lot of things and pretty much no job. So I'm all, hmm. But then along comes Graham from the seventh guest. Magic Leap has nobody in charge of audio for their mixed reality device and he hires me their first audio hire. And that is a big job. So wet instinct kicks in, you know it. We're getting the band back together again. So this time it's going to be an all-star band, right? The Magic Leap Bleepers. Oh, it's going to need a logo on a drum head that's got monkeys and, and Beatles references, right? I'm a believer, monkeys song. I'm a bleeper, right? Beatles font, you get it? And the bleepers included Dave Roach, who sold me my first sequencer and led the Screaming Monkeys to fix your computer sound. Best guy I could find. And Brian Schmidt, who gave this keynote at MIGS last year, and he designed the audio hardware and software for Xbox, so best you can get. And Alan Howarth, the sound designer, Halloween soundtracks, Next Door to the Flakes. Gene Rosenberg, who saved so many games and had saw my picture in the TGI Fridays in Poland. And our audio facilitators, the facilities coordinator, Ben Webster, my studio mentor. And there's Michael Land from LucasArts. It's like a crazy curtain call. And if you know Dave Shumway and Stefan Schutz and Nick LaMartina and Arnaud and Kadar and Brett Shipes and PDX, you're probably all like, new way. And don't get me started about Anastasia. It was so great. I hired about 18 of the best people I knew about. And in my four years, I created the Roadmap for Audio and initiated a bunch of patents. And you can look online. A couple of these patents, I think, could turn out to be money faucets for the company someday. All the reviews for sound have been great. That's really saying a lot about this team. I think this, this may end up being my greatest contribution to the world, maybe. So I brought the circus banner to the office, and it all comes full circle, and it fits itself into a neat little, little bop riding hood basket. But everything changes. Let's change the mood one more time. I got these shots of Abbey Trails from Joe last month. Here's the nuclear waste grease spot from under Good Bad, still there. It's never going away. Here's where the garden hose led to the little shower booth and the fence to the Jiffy Lube. It's a children's play area now. This door was once the booth where the vocals for the seventh guest were recorded. As Joe wrote, kind of poetic, isn't it? It says, grief and loss. And I should probably not Go, th go there, but as always, here I go. Since my position changed at Magic Leap about 16 months ago, it's been another famine between feasts. 16 months! 
Well, this is not a new pattern. I've shown you that. But really? So let's dare to go through that glass door marked grief and loss. Since June of 17, I've done a bunch of things. I've brushed up my business strategy chops, and I've been applying them where I can. I learned Wix, made a couple of pretty sweet websites. I got certified in WISE. I love the 101, 201 courses. Amazing. Finally getting the right tools so that I can take that interactive audio bull by the horns and, and get out from under the thumb of the programmers. I'm writing blogs for them. More coming soon. I've written a whole bunch of songs. Sign up for games, songsforgames.com, bad branding and all, and you'll be in the loop for what I'm most in love with actually doing right now. Of all the things, this is just the most glorious. I get to write with uh, people like Adam Gubman and Steve Kirk, and we want to bring some of that Steven Universe, Disney, uh, Monkeys, Beatles thing, that the power that their songs have, to games and to other places. Bye. When you feel it, you'll never ever doubt that. When you feel it, you'll never be without that. When you feel it, that love you've searched for years for. That's what I'm here for. And above all, I have been looking for work with confidence, with desperation with long and short resumes, with business clothes, with goofy clothes, doing things that I'm good at and things that I would have to fake at first. By cold calls and by asking for advice and help from all those friends I've made along the way. And with all that success and networking and contacts and skill and everything else, I had a lot of trouble breaking the $1,000 mark this year. And I'm thinking like, What's a person have to do to get a gig around here? <laughs> and we're going to go about four minutes over, I think. Anyway, it's not a complaint, but maybe you know somebody in a similar boat. Anybody? No, you don't have to show your hands. <laughs> and it might be healing for those people to know that it's not just them, that even the mighty, fat, super yacht you know, can get up on a sandbar from time to time. And we know other very nice boats that are also up on sandbars. And maybe this is just about me, maybe it's the times, maybe aging, maybe aging in this industry, I don't know, or the nature of life, or how far the pendulum can swing. Maybe game audio is just at odds with product strategy. Maybe I need to just forget this loving and joyful thing and just go for the product strategy boat. I don't know what it is. There's a lesson in there somewhere, and I haven't learned it yet, and that brings us neatly to five things I refuse to learn. Remember this? It's the title of this talk. <laughs> okay, let's go. Any lesson that starts with you have to just gets rejected from my mind and memory. For example, take it seriously. I did not follow the serious star. As you can see, I followed the star where you dress funny, jam with friends, and live gloriously, like Bob Demon taught me to. That was good for a shining 35-year career. Charge what you know you're worth. I'd like to learn that lesson, but your time is worth infinity, and the client wants to pay zero, and you've got to meet them halfway, and, and everybody <laughs> wins and smiles. Remember, remember custom music for $49.95? That actually is the exact halfway point between zero and infinity. Not all mathematicians know that. <laughs> Be smart. You can't. What you know compared to what there is to know will always round down to 0%. That's some math we can all do. It's not necessarily smart to be smart, people. There's lots of ways to define smart, but don't just you know, avoid doing hilarious stuff and saying, I'm being serious, I'm being smart. I hope you've seen in the last 40 minutes some of the weird randomness was critical to my actual business, okay? It attracted great people. It showed a certain integrity, right? Well, he's not doing this for money. And it kept, <laughs> obviously, and it kept me and my team pretty psyched, relaxed, happy and joyfully in the game. You know, this whole balance of life thing, it's not a joke, it's real. And in order to do it, sometimes the smartest thing you can do to do work-life balance is something really stupid.
Likewise, any lesson that starts with you can't, I just can't bear. You can't dress like that, I couldn't help it, sorry. The, I found the tux was in a paper bag. The nudie suits were just about the same story, we'll tell you that later. Jimi Hendrix says, go ahead on, Mr. Businessman, you can't dress like me. And when I heard that, I felt like there was a voice speaking to me from infinity, right? You can't say no to that. Open up a Rolls Royce transmission. I figure I'll, like so many things, I'll either succeed or I'll learn a lesson I desperately needed to learn. And can you live that fantasy? Close enough. I heard somebody say, your music is nothing more than a way to bring people to your brand, and your brand is you. It almost holds up. Like, even if you're thinking about, like, Frank Zappa or, you know, John Lennon, you know, these high integrity acts, it almost holds up. It's the nothing more thing that makes it not work. Yes, they are a brand. But when you put in the nothing more, it kind of tears the heart out of it and fills it with product strategy. And you are so much more. I mean, your music, it's a note that's been going on since the dawn of time, right? And we get to join in for a little while. And maybe your brand is you. But if you're going to say that, so is everything else in the universe. Paradoxes. Love paradoxes that keep me from learning the half-baked lessons. It's good not to learn the wrong lessons, right? For example, half the people that I asked for advice told me, you're the fat man, just be yourself. The other half said, man, you've got to reinvent yourself. So I believe that I have been myself, and I believe that I have reinvented myself. So both, neither, I believe that not knowing is the truer perspective. I helped create a bunch of groups that I'm not at anymore. I don't know if that's good or bad because I don't know what's next. Make yourself irreplaceable seems to be smart for keeping a job, but I don't think I'll do it. Hire your replacement has much more power. It's really fun, but sometimes you get replaced. <laughs> so achievement unlocked, two more lessons not learned. Now, some people say if you make a plan, and write it down, it'll come true. And the video game archive, by the way, is full of my one-year plan, two-year plan, five-year plan, 20-year plans. And a lot of the things I wrote down did come true. But other people say you can't steer the car unless it's moving. And there's truth in there somewhere. More on that later. And one more have to that deserves a category of its own. You have to learn and do everything you possibly can. No, 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 no. OK, I keep hearing that you have to be John, Paul, George, Ringo, and Mal the roadie, and Brian the manager, and George the producer, and Jeff, rest his soul, the engineer, and the guys in the lab coats now, and the record company. And you have to memorize all million patches in your library. And that's not enough, actually. Because if you're serious about music, you have to learn jazz. And if you play guitar, you should learn mandolin and banjo and open tunings. And you should build your own guitars, really. You have to be an engineer, and you have to know the middleware. And actually, you should probably program. But not mastering engineer, for some reason, you have to hire a mastering engineer. <laughs> Is John here? No. OK. And, and you have to go. You have to go to all your local meetings and your national meetings for, for uh, game audio, for games, for audio, for TV, film, uh, and contribute all to, all, uh, to all the organizations. Yeah, you've got to be an officer and a mentor. Come on. You have to nurture your Twitter and Facebook and Fizzle and YouTube and Instagram and Twizzle and Twinkle and, you know, just no. You don't. You don't have to do those things, and you can't. It's a, here's, where I, here's how I see it. It's a hard business, and people are afraid to say that. And so we've come around to where we're blaming ourselves, and we're blaming each other, and we're saying that we're not succeeding because we haven't done enough. Wherever you go, there you are. You work earnestly. If you follow your heart, you're going to learn efficiently. If you rest and you balance and you have peace, you will learn what you're interested in, and you will learn quickly and thoroughly, and as you change interests, you'll build your own unique character, right? Like, like putting those little stars on your character, your strength and, and agility. You build a character, or it's like you're shaping a little Tetris piece, and it's a certain shape. That's called building character. You, you, 
at some point, you don't want to be the biggest Tetris piece. At some time, a little shape will open up, a hole will open up, and your piece will drop in. If my, and, and I want to say this, that's your brand. And if my life tells you nothing else, it should be this. In the right conditions, you can do a little and achieve a lot. In the wrong conditions, you can have record-breaking accomplishments and make no money. And you're allowed to take the risks or avoid them, and it's your dice to roll or not. It's your life. This game was made for you to play, and you are loved, and you are forgiven, and you are absolutely free. So, George, that's very nice that you refuse to learn five things, but how do I make it in game audio? I don't know. <laughs> I've only done it once, and so has everybody else, once or less. But I am proud to say, this is the man who once told me, George, you smile too much. One of my favorite friends to talk with about how to make it is my songwriting collaborator, Kurt Larson, who's a bona fide rock star, a game audio guy, and somehow qualified to be in a Star Trek Hollywood Squares panel alongside George Takei and the Gorn. And he knows a lot of people who have made it, and he says that none of them arrived at where they are by having followed the plan that they made. It's always been a circuitous route, irreproducible, a little bit ready aim fire, a little bit you can't steer the car if it isn't moving, and a lot of you are a leaf in a high wind. And the closest that he and I can come to a rule of thumb is you do stuff and stuff happens. Four more points and we're done. What did I call this? I called this four noble truths. It's not what it seems. What appears to be success is not success. My story needs the highs and the lows and the rising above it all and the failures to be a success story. Everything changes. It is not the same as it used to be, but nothing ever was the same as it used to be, especially since it's not what it seems. See figure one. <laughs> you can't take a step without letting go of the last step. You can't take a breath without letting go of the last breath. It's all a glorious game designed just for you, and if you're having trouble, that's natural because you are playing this game in expert mode by being in game audio. And what do we know about the rules of the game? That you don't learn them until you do stuff. You do stuff, and stuff happens. And you're already at the party. You always were, you always will be. You don't need an invitation, and you don't need a limo. So if you're already at the party, we might as well end the way we started. Take two steps and say to yourself, I have arrived. Take another two steps and say, I am home. Thank you very much.